you can look around and find someone who will say that they are dissatisfied over here, someone over here, back over there. But all normal people are dissatisfied. The dissatisfaction works in a way that's not normally conceived of, but it's on the basis that everything in life is alive and that everything that's alive is in some stage of transition. If you're alive, you are incomplete. So if you're alive, you're dissatisfied. To make any of this <clears throat> make sense, <laughs> let me point out that life itself is not linear. Speech is, therefore anything that's said is in, to some degree distracting, is in some degree a distortion, no matter how well intended, no matter how much be the knowledge of the person saying the words. It simply will not track a non-directional subject. Having said that, everyone can, as your mind will normally do, ignore it. <laughs> De facto, you have no choice under ordinary conditions because you hear linearly. To say that man is incomplete, uh, now we get into the kinds of artificial descriptions. Uh, I'm going to speak of man in a physical sense, his body, and then in a mental sense. It is simply a descriptive misdirection. It is an ad hoc use of the human language to try and get you to look in a certain way because man is no more divided into a mind and the body as you can separate uh, a snake or a child that you can cut it in two and say, well, part of this is mine and part of this is yours. Come to think about you Old Testament scholars, there's an old story about that that's taken a different way. All divisions of life into any verbal category, much less what men normally assume to be some workable physical category, but even verbally, I repeat, is, if taken literally, misleading. So I urge you one more time to try and keep it in mind. But back to the point about being dissatisfied. Now remember, I'm going to start speaking about man physically and mentally, and there is no such discrete division. <coughs> Contraire, the one thing that would, makes man singular to every other creature on this planet, his intellect, is no more separate from his duodenum, his stomach, his kidneys, than one end of a snake is to the other end. In fact, if you do not sometime realize the source of human thought, and it's not Harvard, it was not your mother's <laughs> knee, it was not your extensive reading, it was your digestive system. <clears throat> which, which, speaking of old, at least Western biblical tales, they're true, they're extant in all creation stories around the world, but the idea, to use the one to which you're probably most familiar of, Jehovah giving Adam domain over animals. Uh, that's a nice story, but an in, that's a collective story, which I'll get to probably, maybe, about what collective myths amount to, and what their purpose and their shortcomings are. But the idea of man having dominion over the other creatures, that he is in some way superior, is at best spurious and at worst specious because an individual man doesn't even have dominion over his own animal. It's not an attack. <laughs> Nor is man supposed to at the present time, which those of you that like something a little more up to date, uh, some of the, at least several decades ago, the big grade science fiction movies, the idea that the ultimate development of humanity would be a brain, a brain, a separate brain, that an Einstein type dies in one of these good black and white movies and they in some way keep his brain alive off of a car battery and some sort of acid. <laughs> And you see up on a pedestal in a laboratory somewhere, there's this brain and it pulsates and it gives off weird sounds. And that is the idea, which is not a new idea, for, but I thought I'd give you the opportunity to think that that is an example taken from more recent times. 
with the idea that the ultimate achievement of a man would be simply a brain without the baggage of the body. That's a nice dream, and there's a new version of it that is not taken to be absolute science fiction, much less be great in the idea that through the world of uh, communications, read computers, artificial intelligence. Except people take that seriously. I mean, to the extent that they normally do it, that we have better watch ourselves or we'll develop a machine that will become smarter than us. <laughs> Anyone who believes that uh, is in no danger. They're not going to be harmed by somebody <laughs> being smarter than them. <laughs> because whether you know it or not, you have uncles and their bricklayers in Mississippi smarter than that. They just don't know it. <laughs> Back to the subject. <clears throat> Physically, man is incomplete. But now you've got to watch what I'm trying to point toward. He is incomplete on the basis that now let's speak of man physically and the, at the same level as we would the non-neural creatures on this planet. It's just figure of speech, allegory, parables, and then we'll push it further maybe. The body, the life of the body, the physical life, man has in common with the other creatures. There's not that much distinction between the two for the sake of discussing it. But even physically, a man is continually incomplete on the basis that you must replenish that to keep you alive. That every day physically, maybe several times a day, you have to replenish your foodstuffs, water, then collectively, man must engage in sex to replenish the race. But let's look at individually that every day, everyone from the densest to the most sophisticated must replenish himself. So he is incomplete physically. That is part of being alive, that you must continually re-nourish yourself. No one finds fault with that. And from now on, I say no one. I'm speaking on the basis of sane, ordinary, down the middle of the road men and women on this planet. Just ordinary, sane people. They find no fault with that. And they do not really think about it as being an irritation. But there is an irritation higher up the nervous system in a man. When we get to the area of the mind, it is incomplete. And it is a constant source of irritation or dissatisfaction, if you find that to be a bit more palatable. A man is incomplete. Without giving it any analysis, men are aware of it. Again, I repeat, ordinary men. So if you start looking for strange anomalies in history or in your own family, you're wasting your time. We're talking about the squarest of the squares, the biggest, the poster boy for the bourgeoisie in life. <laughs> they are irritated intellectually, but they do not find it to be an irritation as such. They do not, because if it was an irritation such as what we would assume would bring someone attention to activities such as this, they find it to be an acceptable irritation. They will, in fact, life provides, in fact, collectively, means of not curing the dissatisfaction, but it's a kind of bomb. It goes all the way from religion, psychology, the belief in uh, education, that is, that continuing education will eventually solve or soothe, cure the irritation, the feeling of being incomplete. Now, education is a fine hobby. It's just as good as any. But for anyone to ever understand anything about life, you have got to very quickly see that what life normally provides is not that which will cure this intellectual dissatisfaction. Uh, in fact, it should be that anyone who is here, not by accident, has gone through a somewhat archetypical progress of trying to find out uh, whatever terms you used in your own mind at the time or in the past that you believed you were see seeking uh, some sort of mystical activity, that you were seeking some sort of cult, some sort of guru, some sort of mystical aspect of religion, whatever it was. Uh, you started out in a fairly pedestrian manner. Again, if you were sane while simultaneously having this kind of extensive 
personal irritation over the natural irritation, <laughs> then you should have already gone to a priest, a rabbi, a professor of philosophy, your parents, people that you thought were intelligent, plus I'm sure extensive reading, and many times you felt as though that you were very close to something, you were on the verge of having some sort of extraordinary experience, and I'm sure many of you uh, have partaken of the psychedelic substances available on this planet, and in conjunction with that kind of reading and that kind of desire, felt very close to having, having had a transcendental experience of actually seeing into the nature of life to some degree that it was not available on a theoretical basis or that it had never been possible based upon your reading. So we're left with men in general being incomplete, that is, you're alive. The body can be satisfied daily or else you die. You do not even look at it normally as being a kind of dissatisfaction. You simply say, I'm hungry, let's get something to eat, and you eat. And for the time being, you are satisfied. The physical dissatisfaction is gone. So the dissatisfaction is of an alternative, or an alternate condition. Because you're dissatisfied, then you're satisfied. The intellect has no such parallel recourse. I'm sure that many people you have felt satisfied in a sense uh, from such things as taking up a new intellectual field of interest, uh, whether it was in formal education or just running to the encyclopedia when you heard a certain term or you heard uh, somebody on television mention the chaos theory. And you think, well, what is that? And you go and read up or you find a science magazine, just picking that out at random, and you read something and it seems to be of some interest. It seems to be at least to your mind something that's of collective interest that a civilized, sophisticated, up-to-date, well-read man or woman should know about. And you read it, you might have to read it several times, and there is a distinct pleasure over learning something new. But that kind of dissatisfaction, the intellectual dissatisfaction, is never absolutely soothed for someone that uh, might be involved, might be interested in such as this. There is no common nourishment, there is no sort of knowledge available that will soothe this. There are, so I can skip some of the terms and put everybody at ease or at Ill, Ill at ease, you have your choice. It's great to be an American and live in a free country, so. <laughs> even for Lithuanians. Uh, this sort of activity has been around as far as there's recorded history, if you know how to translate it. And it's been called everything, I'll just, I'm not going to, by any means, attempt to give any sort of historical lesson in what this is. Uh, but just to use commonly known Western terms, the enlightenment, an awakening of consciousness, a liberation of the mind, a liberation of consciousness. And in the religions, even, you can if you want to scrape away enough, you can find things like in Christianity and even Judaism, the idea of a new kingdom, a new Jerusalem, or the kingdom of God, which is all a new state, a new condition of man. And people interested in such as that have been called, just to make it simple, normally mystics. And when I use it, I do not infer in any way any sort of spiritual, any known spiritual, religious, metaphysical, new age, anything. I simply mean on the basis uh, of one of the definitions, I'll go, so that I didn't actually tort the word beyond recognition. Yeah. It's the belief that there is knowledge that one can possess, there's knowledge available somewhere, and no man might possess it, that's beyond the normal workings of the mind. And if you can extract all your past imagination or any imagination you have, then it's pretty straightforward. Ordinary minds would dismiss it by saying, well, there can't be any such thing. If there was such a thing, but now our educators, the great thinkers of the world, the physicists, the philosophers, the theologians, somebody would have stumbled across it. <laughs> the mystics of the world, the would-be mystics, uh, itch in a place that they cannot scratch. They are as dissatisfied, to begin with, intellectually, 
many people that would believe that they were potential mystics many times do not like the immediate use of that word of intellectual because they believe it's something more than that, and it is, and it's less, and it's more, and it's less, and it's something sideways. But it is not, in some sense, a spiritual, that is, something that is extra systemic. There is no extra systemicism in life. Life is life. And the belief that there is something outside the system, the whole idea of a god, either up in the heavens or painted on black velvet from Mexico, <laughs> is simply a hobby. It is a hobby. There are other ways I could describe the use of it besides having something to do with you laughing, I guess. There are other ways to describe the purpose it serves of believing that there are forces or a force possible outside the system because that is like a, an escape valve to let the pressure off the mind when people try to consider, well, how did things get this way? And you do not have to be fundamentally religious. You can be nowadays a cosmologist and come up with your own theory that they've about run the Big Bang in the ground about well, the whole idea of cosmology, but the idea that, all right, since we, the mind works in linear manner and cannot conceive of the infinite other than a, an equation, then it, they have to finally think, well, wait a minute, what was there before the Big Bang? And as long as you will ask the question, which the mind will entertain the question, as long as you will ask the question, you are still operating on the basis that there is something possible extra systemic, that there is something outside this closed system of life itself as perceived by ordinary consciousness at best. People who might be seriously, forgive the word, people who might be wired up to be individually, personally interested in mysticism. They have got to understand, they've got to realize the purpose, finally, of what the dissatisfaction is. You have to individually understand it. Nobody can tell you that's part of the job of religion again. It's a sidecar, it's a chaser to the main drink of being civilized. <laughs> but you've got to understand personally, you've got to realize the basis of why you're dissatisfied. It's in you, it's in everyone, but you have to understand what is in you. And until you realize that, there's no chance of no possibility of ever doing anything about it. That is where you have, have to divide things up again for you, into, let's just call it uh, <coughs> mystical systems. Let's call it mythical systems, so I don't have to say mystical. And That's a rather middle of the road word. <laughs> 